Okay, hi everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Document DB from the Dining Table. We'd like to welcome you to our show, and I'd like to introduce two of my uh, my co-host Karthik uh, is joining me today uh, from Dallas, Texas, one of the suburbs of Dallas, Texas, as well as Cody Allen joining us as well from Dallas, Texas. So I'm outnumbered here. The uh, New York City city slicker is uh, getting worried. I don't know. But here we are, and we have some good content for you today. We're going to be talking about how you build resilient applications, starting off uh, with Karthik talking about that, and then Cody's going to show us how to use uh, some document to be audit trails to generate some alerts, for example, maybe when too many people are uh, having password authentication issues and, and stuff like that. All right. I'm going to drop some some links into the chat that give you some uh, some videos to watch if you're new to DocumentDB and you just want an intro. We have some great content from reInvent that was recorded, and today we're going to be diving deep into some of this stuff. So, Karthik, Cody, thanks for joining me today. And let me turn it over to Karthik. He's got some stuff he wants to talk about first about resilient applications. All right. Thanks, Chad. Hello, everyone. Uh, Chad, can you hear me okay? I can hear you great. Do you have uh, some, some stuff you want to share? Yes, I'm going to select share screen here. Let me know when you see it. Yes, I'll add it in here. OK, you're good to go. Perfect. That's exactly the screen I wanted to share. All right. Cool. So good morning, good afternoon, folks that are joining us here. Uh, super excited to be talking to you about uh, building resilient applications with uh, Document DB. So, uh, in the last couple months, uh, and I've uh, released a couple of blogs here, like a two-part series uh, to you know uh, help folks on you know best practices for building uh, resilient applications. So, Chad, uh, the, the screen share sh here shows the um, you know the blogs. I'll, I'll Chad, if you don't mind pasting the links, uh, or I can do that later as well. Uh, so the first part over here talks about client configuration, and I'll, I'll be I'll be uh, uh, diving deep into it. I'll be showing the code and all that stuff. Uh, but in this in this uh, part one, I focus more on you know connections and uh, you know the the various parameters that you can set. And more often than not, you know customers and and, and developers that I talk to ask me, hey, how do you go about you know setting the right value for connection pool? You know what does what does uh, you know uh, a particular attribute means like uh, you know uh, max wait time or you know connect time? What, what are the difference between these things, right? So and you know this I, I did like you know try to send them some link that is you know just by standard Google, but there was nothing that was easily you know searchable. So I thought like you know based on all the information that I had and and based on the working experience with NoSQL databases, I thought I'll put something together uh, in in a flow that helps. Uh, you know, developers to set up the right client configuration so that their application is resilient to failures. So that's that's the focus for part one. And then, like uh, while working on this, I was like, mm, it's not just about you know uh, connecting to Document DB. What what happens after you connect to Document DB? What happens when you you know uh, create your uh, connection and then like start uh, you know performing CRUD operations? Then what? Right. So what what are the best practices there? That that was the you know that led to uh, part two over here, which is about exception handling, right? So what what are the best practices when it comes to uh, you know exception handling? You know how do you handle uh, transient and persistent errors, and you know what kind of uh, retry mechanism should you do, and how does it vary by uh, various CRUD operations, even as a transaction? So that's that's what I cover in, in this blog. And I'll, I'll take the next few minutes here to basically dive deep into uh, you know each of these. Uh, so let me bring up my IntelliJ over here. Oh, I think the screen is still refreshing, so I'll just give them a second here. Okay. I thought I thought we were all using VI for editing code. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I edited in VI and then pasted into IntelliJ. <laughs> Oh, well, we're okay. judging you that's, for that. That's unacceptable. That's acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> Differing opinions here. <laughs> I'll allow it. I'm making a ruling. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I've been watching. I've been rewatching Sopranos, so I'm thinking about you know having to sit down and making a ruling. Uh, cool. So, so you see this uh, 
you know, the connection string here. So the first one you see over here, uh, I've just uncommented it. And all this code is available in GitHub, and I'll, I'll share the link uh, to that as well. It's actually linked to the blog as well. So, you know, the standard connection string uh, or the MongoDB connection string is, is over here, right? So if, you, if you're just like trying to set a read preference and, and go on, that's, that's perfectly fine. You can use it. But you know, uh, if you want to set those advanced uh, parameters, um, you know, I, I like to use uh, you know uh, the uh, client builder and and set it up. So he, here I'm using the client builder, and I'll just be walking through this uh, few lines of code here, right? So the first one over here, we are giving the cluster endpoint again. Karthik, Karthik, I, I think some people are having trouble seeing it. Are you able to make the font bigger? Oh, sorry about that. Let's see. Is that better? Bigger, bigger is better, I think. Here in this case, yeah, that's bigger. that's that's pretty good. Is that big enough? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. All right. So uh, for folks that are not familiar with the various endpoints that Document DB offers, right? So when you create a cluster, you get you get a couple endpoints. One is cluster endpoint. There are instance instance endpoints and reader endpoints as well. Uh, but we strongly recommend to use cluster endpoint. Uh, and, and you can pass the cluster endpoint uh, to the cluster settings using the builder like this. Uh, the port is always going to be 27017. That's the default port. Um, we, I haven't seen you know anybody having need to change that yet. But when you create the cluster, there's an option to do so. And then one of the best practices to connect to document DB is to use replica set. And uh, this particular setting, uh, required cluster type, Will let you, uh, you know, choose the cluster type as replica set. The other options are standalone and, and sharding. Document DB doesn't support support sharding as of yet. Um, but again, the best practice is to use replica set. And what advantage this this has is, you know, your uh, when in, when your client connects to Document DB as a replica set, uh, any changes you make to the cluster, let's say you want to scale uh, by adding an instance, all those discovery, the cluster topology discovery happens automatically, right? So uh, you, you don't have to come back and make any changes over here, say, they, OK, I need to point to this endpoint or that endpoint. You just connect as a replica set, and the client sees the cluster in its current state um, all the time. And then the replica set, the default name is RS0. So you know it's, 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 a, it's a standard name. You cannot change it. So you know give the replica set a name. And then here we are saying connection mode is multiple. Uh, because you're, you're going to be talking to a cluster, which is going to be a bunch of nodes or instances. Um, so that's that's the uh, you know, mode. And then the read preference. Again, we strongly recommend to use read preference as secondary preferred. This allows you to you know, uh, use all the instances. So when you use read preference as secondary preferred, your client is going to be uh, you know, able to route drop in the request to the available read replicas. Uh, so that, like you know, you uh, you'll be leveraging all your re read replicas and not like you know uh, running into any hotspot or you know uh, pointing just primary or over overloading or overwhelming the primary instance. So the, here you set the read preference. So these are you know all these things you can certainly uh, you know set through the connection string, which I have commented over here as well. So this is pretty standard and best practices, and uh, you know allows you to leverage your, your cluster uh, from a scalability standpoint and also from a resiliency standpoint. Because when you say cluster, when you use the cluster endpoint, uh, you know, when, whenever the primary instance goes down, which can take the writer or, uh, writes into it, uh, when the new primary instance comes up, it, uh, document DB, uh, your, your, your application will automatically be talking to that new primary instance in document DB. So your writes will continue to go through. So. Uh, you know, so those are standard settings. And then, like, you know, uh, as a best practice, uh, when, when you launch a cluster, uh, there is a default cluster parameter group that you can use, uh, which comes with um, TLS enabled, right? So, uh, you can, again, best practice is used, is used to, is to use TLS or SSL. Uh, so here I have enabled SSL. And then, like, give, give your credentials. So all these are standard uh, inputs. Now comes the uh, you know interesting parameters over here like the the max pool size. So uh, most of you guys would be familiar with uh, connection pool. It's it's basically a cached set of connections that the application can you know use and reuse to avoid creating new database connections every request. But different database solutions has like you know their own mechanisms of implementing it. MongoDB has DocumentDB has uh, you know uses that through their drivers. 
And you know, if you, the, the question earlier I was talking about is how to you know set a max pool size. I, I typically say you know you can set it up to a value that is like somewhere between 10, 20 percent more than the number of concurrent queries that your application runs. So if you know that your application is going to be running like you know 10 concurrent queries, set it up to 12 or 13 or something like that, uh, so that like you, you have some some buffer if the, if those requests have the the concurrency has to go up. Right, and I'll also be talking about you know how you can go about uh, based on the query SLAs subsequently here, um, and also important thing to know about connection pool is they are declared when uh, the Mongo client is initialized, and you know all the connections in the pool will be dropped when the Mongo client is, is stopped or, or terminated. Right, so uh, we'll talk more about connection pool in terms of how to efficiently manage the number of connections and all in a bit here. So that's the max max size. There's also a min pool size that you can set, uh, but here I'm setting the, just the max pool size to about ten, uh, so that like you know uh, there are there are ten connections that are available in the pool uh, for my queries to be uh, to to use, so that when they they can they can you know get a handle to the connection object to interact with DocumentDB. And then uh, the max weight queue size. So we talked about connection pool. There are so many connections. Carson, sorry, just a question. What what happens if that number is undersized? Like you you actually need more than ten. What what would happen in that case? If if that is undersized, so that's 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 the the next actually the next attribute over here. So let's say that you set it up to ten, right? And then now uh, let's say you're running an async driver where you know the, the undersized thing generally happens within the async drivers because you know there are parallel queries uh, which could be using you know one, let's say you have like ten parallel or twelve parallel queries and you set it undersized it to ten now right your, your parallel queries are going to be using these connection objects and then the the two of them are not going to have a connection object so you can use this max uh, weight queue size. Which is basically it tells how many threads can wait for the connection to become available from the pool. So those those uh, threads or, or the queries are going to be waiting for a connection object to be available from the pool, right? So um, you know, if, and, and if you go more than that, let's say in this case I said max Q, wait queue size is two. So and if I had twelve queries, then these two are going to be waiting. If I have more than that, then you're going to be seeing a Mongo wait queue full exception. So when you see this. That means that there are more threads that are waiting because there are connections that are not available, and to remediate that, you can increase the max pool size so that you know there are more connections available to serve those those threads. Is there really any downside to making the max pool size much bigger? Like, why well, not just make it a hundred? You can, but then you're gonna your, your SLAs are gonna be like impacted because so many queries are gonna be waiting, right? So. Uh, you know, if, if 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 all that you care about is less number of connections, because let's say you have a very small server with limited memory, but you don't care about SLAs, then yeah, that that should be fine. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, I'm just yeah. Okay, okay. cool. Um, and then the uh, we we talked about connections. We talked about threads that are going to be waiting for those connections. Now, at an individual thread level. Uh, you know, you can set how many, how much time, the maximum time that this thread can wait for a connection to become available, right? So um, that's that's the wait queue time MS over here, or the max wait time, right? So in this case, we are setting it to two minutes, saying that okay, threads, you guys can wait for this connection to be available, and wait, each thread can wait for about two minutes, right? So. Uh, and, and if the time is reached, then you'll be seeing a Mongo timeout exception to be raised. And again, to remediate that, you can do two things, right? The simplest remedy would be to increase the max pool size so that there are less threads waiting, and then these threads don't time out because they're already with the connection working uh, on um, and running a query or something like that. But the right way to do that is to look at why there are so many threads waiting, right? If, is there a legitimate reasons for this thread to wait? Because uh, normally threads are going to be waiting if the preceding thread, which is using a connection, is taking more uh, amount of time, right? Lo or in other words, if that thread is running long queries or having a long, uh, long running queries, and if this happens, that that tells me that you know there is an opportunity to tune those queries for performance, right? So look for those queries, long running queries, and tune them for performance. So 
you know that so if you see threat to be timing out then like look for why those connections are being consumed for so long so that's the max wait time which is at a per thread level and how much time those threads should be waiting and then connection timeout this is a standard setting again right so this is the amount of time a driver would wait before it stops attempting new connections so document db is a vpc only service and uh, you know when you're when you're um, connecting your application uh, from your I mean, connecting document db from your application you know the default time for this is 10 seconds that should be more than enough for for your driver to establish a connection with document db so I would leave it at the default setting, uh, you know, so, uh, because within within the VPC, it should take, the max it should ideally take is you know five seconds. I mean, even that is very very rare, right? So common causes for these uh, Mongo timeout exceptions, if you see, and, and this is again something that we see often, right? Is hey, I'm getting a timeout from the from the database. Common causes for these are security group misconfiguration. So like I said, DocumentDB is a VPC only service, and the best practice. Is to when you create a cluster, you can you can you know assign a security group. The best practice is to you know assign a security group with an inbound rule that allows access from your uh, application server only, right? So if, if that inbound rule is not configured properly, then you'll be getting these security timeout uh, or uh, connection timeout exceptions. And then you know you can you can also uh, you know to uh, be, be frugal and and to manage your connections efficiently. Set a, uh, another attribute called uh, connection idle time, so max connection idle time. So if you if you set this value, then you know it tells the driver that if the connection is idle, you know close it once this time is met, right? And again, another best practice when it comes to connection timeout is to uh, you know uh, ensure that you are setting the timeout to a value that is higher than your session duration. Let's say you know that your, uh, your, your queries are going to take you know, X seconds. Then set a timeout to a value that is more than that so that, so that you know, your connections don't prematurely time out. And then you, you, you'll be create closing connections, opening connections. That will not result in optimal use of your resources. So understand what your uh, you know, maximum session durations are. And then you know uh, set values accordingly uh, for the idle time so that you don't you don't think that the or the driver doesn't think that your connections are idle and closes them. And then like uh, another best practice which I'll, I'll dive into a little bit is you know uh, when it comes to connections is to use singleton pattern. This is almost in all databases, right? You don't want to be like creating tons of connections. So use use a pattern design pattern like singleton. So that again, this is Java. So in the JVM, there is there's one instance of the client object, right? So and I'll I'll show that to you as well on how how this is implemented as a single gen. And then uh, you know moving down the list here, the the server selection timeout. This is the maximum time that the driver will wait to select an instance for an operation before it can raise a timeout exception. So document DB has multiple instances, one is a primary and, and the others are, are read replicas. So when you're issuing a write, it goes to primary and when you're issuing a read, it goes to secondaries and the driver has to select these instances. And the default, and this is basically the service uh, selection uh, process, right? And the default timeout value here is 30 seconds, which I think is good enough because let's say a failover process happens where the primary instance goes down and a new primary has to come up. Right. This process takes, you know, again, in, in our documentation, we've advertised this that it takes about 30 seconds. Generally, it takes much uh, lesser than that. But again, that is good enough default time uh, for the server selection, uh, you know, uh, timeout value uh, that, that helps the driver to pick the right instance for the new right, for the right operation of the new instance in this case. Again, uh, we'll, we'll talk about exception handling in a bit here, but handling these exceptions would help. Uh, you know, to take appropriate actions. Let's say, hey, okay, I'm getting a server selection timeout. Should I re retry this or not? And things like that. You can, if you handle those exceptions, you can make those decisions. And then the last one is read timeout or socket timeout, right? So it's basically the amount of time for sending or receiving data on a socket before the connection times out or, or the socket times out. So you'll you'll see, uh, you know, a variant of Mongo socket exception, Mongo socket read exception or write exception. And it is raised when you know when the driver cannot either read or write uh, from the socket. And again, 
default value at least in Java is zero. I would say leave it at zero unless you are very sure about your query parameters. And if the socket timeout occurs, you know, keep in mind that it's just the socket that has timed out. Nothing has happened on the server side. So what this means is the queries on the database don't terminate. They, they continue to run, right? So the resources on the database are being utilized. It is just that your socket has timed out, so your application cannot get the data back from that from that socket. So, now, uh, would you say that the settings, I mean, this is Java, do, do all of the other various language bindings and SDKs have all the exact same settings? Uh, kind of function pretty the much. same way? Pretty much. And in my blog, I've called it out, uh, you know, the default value. I think, I think, uh, I forgot if it was Node.js or Ruby, one of it has the socket read timeout or socket timeout as five seconds. Um, so there are some some differences in the default values. Uh, by, by the driver, but most of the drivers support all of these settings. All right. Yeah, because on the DynamoDB side, we run into cases sometimes like where the the, the Node.js SDK doesn't reuse connections by default. I mean, that's not Dynamo specific. That's just the whole AWS Node.js SDK, and you got to go turn that on. And, and that's different than some other language binding. So I wasn't sure if yeah. you know, there were really language specific things going on here. Yeah, the only language specific thing that I've observed is <laughs> these these variables, these these uh, met methods are named differently, which is is not really convenient, but it is what it is. That that's how the drivers are. Oh, okay. They yeah. all they all have the methods, but they might have different names. Right. Yeah. Some of them do. Yeah. Just keeping okay. you on your toes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you know. Um, I just quickly wanted to show that the singleton pattern, right? So again, it's it's nothing new. Singleton is a very common pattern. So if you look at how I'm I'm creating this Mongo client, uh, let me go to the the caller. So here is so the connection is a is one class, and I, I invoke that from from my application over here. So you can see that this line of code over here which says oh, I should I should zoom this. Sorry. Okay. Hopefully you can see it better now. So I'm trying to get a handle to the cl client here. So I'm saying get instance and get client. Right. So so what 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 happens here is when I, when the get instance is called again, this is a static method, a uh, public static method I can call from anywhere, and if it will it will create a connection, uh, only if one doesn't exist. If it exists, it's just going to return it, and. And only this class, again, that's 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 the core thing about singleton, right? Private constructor. So only this class uh, can create an instance because the constructor is private. And uh, here it's going to say get Mongo client. And get Mongo client is the method that we were just discussing. And at the end of it, it's going to set all those settings. You know, say Mongo clients create client, and it is going to return the Mongo client. Like I said, when it creates it, it creates all the connections in the connection pool uh, because the, the connections in the connection pool are associated to the client object. And when this, uh, you know, if, if you dispose this instance or object, then all those connections are also going to go away. Hey, Karthik, I have a quick question about this. Um, you know, in our best practices, we talk about using secondary preferred as the reader method, but we do give you the ability to, on a per query basis, use writer preferred or, or primary preferred so that if you needed that read after write consistency, how would you incorporate that so that you had one particular query or one application that needed that uh, read after write consistency? Right, so you can you can either have a separate client object for that and just, just say that though that's name it as primary object and set the read preference on that for uh, as primary, that will be a cleaner way to do it. And in that, you can have a less less number of connection objects, right? Because you, you're going to have very few connections going to primary. So you can just have that, and then like you can you can call that as a you know Mongo client primary, Mongo client secondary, and then go from there. I see. As opposed to passing in a parameter to change that, because <laughs> if that you would inherit those larger uh, those larger sizes, and you probably don't want that for that read after write consistency. Exactly. That makes sense. Yep. Okay. Um, so a couple other things I've covered in the blog are about cursors. So you know, cursors uh, are something that you know are are created when uh, when you perform read operations. So actually, I wanted to go to this method. So here, I'll I'll come into these methods in a bit, but I'm just going to show you. 
this one, but yeah, over here. So here I'm performing a read operation. And when you perform read operations that are going to, you know, written bulk results, uh, you know, you can get the cursor, uh, you will get the cursor, and then you can iterate through the cursor to, you know, read the data, send it to your caller or whoever, how you want to use the data. But at the end of it, like, like, like I've shown here in a finally block, please do close the cursors because cursors are resources uh, and you know you need to use those resources uh, you know uh, appropriately uh, by default document db after 10 minutes of you know inactivity uh, for a cursor we do close out or close those cursors but that's not the best way to manage cursors but when you use it uh, you know right, right after you're done this finally block will anyhow execute just close the cursor there uh, again keep in mind that the, uh, like i said it's a it's a resource and there are limits based on your instance size the largest instance support somewhere around 4,500 plus cursors, but still, right, you use them frugally and close them and you're not using them. So, and, and also, you know, uh, for the DBAs out there, if you wanna see if your application developers are closing it or not, you look at the database cursors max metrics, and I believe there's a database cursors time dot metric to see if that number is continuously going up. If it does, then, you know, that means that you know, somebody has left a cursor uh, uh, unclosed or, or left it open. So, so that's that's about the cursors, and for the connection limit, right? So, con even, even connections are also resources and should be used uh, uh, frugally. Uh, so, you know, if you are using connections, like I said, the max pool setting we talked about. You know, how to set it at ten or twenty percent more than the max uh, concurrent queries. Also, one thing to consider is. Now, what is your longest running query? So when you when you write these queries, uh, we all do performance testing, or at least like we know what what the query SLA is, and what is your overall microservice SLA? Let's say you have a microservice which is running, you know, one query that takes about three seconds. That's that's the best performance you could get. It could be because of the data it's dealing with multiple reasons, right? Let's say it takes three seconds, and you have like you know five other queries that just takes one second. Now the long pole in the tent here is the three three second query. So the, the best SLA you can get is three three query uh, three seconds, right? So there is no point in creating one connection for all, each of those one second queries, right? So you can you can say you know the max pool size in this case is three. One would be taken by the three second query. The other uh, you know five uh, seconds for each of those five one second queries can be handled by the other two connections, still getting you the you know, three as the as the SLA, three seconds as the SLA, and you can get that with just three connections as opposed to one connection per query, which will be like eight connections. So again, these are all very workload specific things, but the idea here is to understand what is the long running qu uh, query or what, what, what the long pull in the tent is gonna look like, and then like, you know, see how many connections do you really need, knowing that that's the best SLA you're gonna get. Right, and again, database connections. The maximum limit on the largest instance is about thirty thousand, and this limit is on a per instance basis, not a cluster level. So each instance can support up to thirty thousand concurrent connections, and you can look at the database connections max metric uh, to see how many connections are used. And both for cursors and database metrics, you can always set alarm. I typically set an alarm around eighty percent, so that I'm notified that I'm, I'm I'm getting closer to that limit, and either you know scale out or scale up or you know, talk to the application team. And then like, you know, uh, the other thing I wanna call out is, you know, in this, in this setting over here, if you notice, I did not pass any value for write uh, concern or journal because document DB, uh, you know, uh, by default uses a write concern of majority and journal as true. So even if you send a value as one, we, we convert it into majority because we wanna ensure that we are durably storing your write. So that is one functional differences in, uh, in behavior and how uh, document DB operates in MongoDB. We, we ensure that your writes are durable, so we overwrite the value. So we don't expect you to pass a value, but even if you pass, we, we set, it, set it to majority and general to true. So that's, that's about client configuration. Uh, I'll quickly cover the uh, exception handling that, that, that's uh, also available in the same code repo. So, the reason you need to do exception handling is, you know, when, there are there are a couple of different types of errors you get, right? You get a transient error, like a blip in network, like maybe it just a uh, you know split second thing that happened, 
uh, or there is a failover, which takes about 30 seconds or, or most, more, more often than not much lesser than that. Uh, so these are all the errors which last for a few seconds, uh, which, which I refer as transient errors. And there could be like persistent errors which last for longer than that, maybe a few minutes, maybe, maybe an hour or more. Like, like let's say there's a SSL handshake that is failing because somebody let a certificate expire, right? So that's gonna take at least a minute or two or more to, to fix, or if there is a persistent network outage. So those are all persistent errors. Now knowing that we have two different types of errors, what is the best way to handle it? The best way to handle the error is obviously, you know, uh, do something about it, right? But if it is, if the challenge in this case is, you know, it's it's very hard to distinguish between these errors because they're written similar exceptions or errors, and you know, uh, the, the natural tendency is to just go and retry, right? But if you retry transient errors, which is great, right? It, because we know it could eventually succeed, uh, and you know, you will you will get that operation to complete, like specifically the right operations. But what happens if you retry persistent errors? It is not going to succeed, and it's going to sit there and waste your system resources. So how do you approach this? I mean, ideally, you would want to just retry your transient errors and avoid retrying persistent errors. But, but the challenge is, right, like to differentiate between them, it, it makes this, this, this uh, ideal scenario you know, less than ideal or, or challenging. So you can take an all or nothing approach, but that doesn't work because when you always retry, you're wasting system resources on the, on the persistent exceptions. When you don't retry, you're missing out on opportunity to you know, uh, let your transient exception succeed. So, you know, so all or nothing approach is not gonna work. Then you know, what, what, what can we do? So the, the best way to go about it is to retry with exponential back off, right? That's, that's a good strategy because with this strategy, you can control how many times you wanna retry and you can avoid you know, excessive uh, retries for those pers pers persistent errors. And I'll show you some examples here, right? Uh, let's, let's start with the auto failover. Um, you know, if you retry uh, auto failover uh, or, or errors that come due to auto failover, uh, you know, you, let's say you, you know that it's gonna take about 30 seconds at the max. And let's say you, you retry with an exponential back off. You start, then you wait, you start, and then you wait. That's, that's exponential back off, right? So let's say you do that for 30 seconds or even 10 seconds, which is, which is ideally, you know, how much it takes or lesser than that. But you're not going to be, you know, indefinitely retrying. So if there is a, you know, let's say a server selection timeout happens, let's say you retry for 10 seconds and get your failover, auto failover issue or exception handled, and the um, server selection timeout, which you saw, is about 30 seconds. You don't have to wait until then. So you're you're not going to be retrying indefinitely or for a longer time with exponential retry. You can control the number of times you're retrying and you know uh, how long you're going to be waiting between each of these retries. And that's the example that I'll be share, uh, showing uh, in the code here. And, and before we jump into those examples, right? what is the best practice? So what are some challenges with this retry? Right? Um, if the operation is not item potent, meaning if with every retry, your output should be the same. Let's say you have an update operation. And in an update operation, you're saying, I want to increment the value. right? Let's say you did a, a retry. The update you got an error, but it, it could still be you know on the, on the server side you know the update made it through, but for the application if the application received an error and if you're retrying again you're going to be your update is going to be resulting in a non-item potent output or it's going to be a non-item potent operation because you're going to be updating it twice, right? So it is important to make your operations item potent. If they are non-item potent, you need to look at how to make it item potent, and I'll share an example for that as well. So let's let's talk about the CRUD operations, right? Insert operation. How can you make it item potent? Send an ID to it, right? If you're if you're passing an ID to it, you inserted it. Next time you try to insert the same, uh, you know, document, it's going to give you a duplicate key exception. Uh, updates can have non-item potent operators like like increment uh, or multiply or add. There are so many operation operators like that. If you have those operations, then you know uh, I have a suggested two step update process, where in the first step, you just put in a tracker to the document, and then the next update uh, step, you would say, hey, if that tracker exists, only then update, and along with that, pull it out. And I'll show that, and I'll show you like how those uh, update operations that uses uh, that, that have non-item potent, we can make, it, make them item potent by using uh, some operators like add to set, which are item potent by behavior. Um, 
And then like, you know, reads are simple. They're item potent. You read the same thing multiple times. You're going to get the same value. Deletes are also like either you, you deleted it or you did not, right? So if it, if it is deleted, then it's not going to complain. And if you have bulk deletes, then, you know, use uh, maybe like a, like a predicate or like a time predicate, delete between time X and Y or something like that, right? So uh, so that's that's that, those are some of the best practices in a nutshell, making them item potent. And, uh, you know, uh, with, with, with retries, you know, and uh, there are a couple of options, right? Whether you should retry once or you should retry multiple times with exponential back off. For read operations, retrying once is sufficient because, <clears throat> uh, you know, when, when the read fails because a replica is not available, again, I'm assuming that you're using read preference as secondary preferred, and let's say the replica is not available, then you can retry once, and the next time the client sends a retry, it goes to a new uh, uh, instance. But with writes, you got to retry multiple times because when it goes to the primary instance and the primary is not available, let's say auto failover is happening, then you need a retry with exponent back off. And that's the code sample over here. Uh, so demo, first let's talk about reads, which is the simplest one. So I'm saying reads with retry, uh, and if the retry count is less than max retry, which is one. So I'm doing a retry once here. And the ret I also have populated a possible error list, which is basically you know some some known exceptions which happen which which are result of transient errors like socket open, socket read, not primary or node is recovering kind of exceptions. These are all some of the known exceptions which we know. Okay, if, if it happens, retrying might help. Um, so let's go back to our uh, demo reads with retry, and here we are checking if this exception that you got for this for this read operation. Is this retry eligible? Basically, if it is, if this exception uh, made it to this list. If so, um, you know, in this case, if it is not, then you are just like throwing that exception. You are not retrying. If it is, then you just say, you know, sleep. Right? You sleep for a second, and then you come back. You increase the count. So you, after you sleep, it's just going to go and again try to perform the read operation. So that's yeah, I, I really like this classification of some errors being retriable and some not being retriable. That's that's really nice. Yeah, I mean the idea is to you know as much as possible differentiate uh, between these uh, you know transient and non-transient errors or transient and persistent errors, uh, so that you can avoid wasting system resources by avoiding retrying those persistent errors. I do want to switch over and give Cody the last fifteen minutes here. If, if sure. do you have any last points you want to wrap up with? Yeah, just just the last one is demo with retry. Uh, in this case, one only thing I want to call out is it's it's pretty much same methods. I'm retrying multiple times here. I'm using a capped exponential back off with jitter. And this is basically to determine how much time you should be waiting, right? And uh, it, it adds randomization in the, and caps the duration of the backup. Again, all this code is available. I uh, hope you guys understand the concept of uh, you know, why to retry and uh, you know, how retries for writes are with exponential back off helps uh, versus retry once for reads are, are sufficient. So I just wanted to you know, communicate that message with that. I know I took more time, so apologies, Cody. I'll give it back to you guys. No, that's super important. So all of this code is linked in from the blog post, right, Karthik? It is, yes. Good. All right, we'll post those links again for anybody who happened to join late. And um, thanks, Karthik. All right, Cody, over to you. Let's see what you got to demo today. Yeah, thanks. No, that what, what Karthik is talking about is really, really important. And until he created those blog posts, there was a lot of ambiguity. There was a lot of reading between the lines and putting stuff together through the developer guide to kind of get what he's put together. So definitely read through it. Really, really helpful. I know that I've been in a pinch a couple of times and I've, I've used that blog post. Um, but the thing I wanted to talk about was uh, auditing, auditing and document DB. So we, uh, with, audit, with document DB, you can audit events that were performed against your cluster. And when you enable this, you can record uh, DDL, data definition language, authentication, authorization, or even user management events. And all of these go to uh, CloudWatch, to a CloudWatch log. So in relational databases, this is going to be things like creating or altering a table. But in document DB, this is going to be things like creating or dropping uh, collections. This is going to be things like watching for when an index is created or even when a user is updated. And since all these logs are going over to CloudWatch, that means that you can create custom metrics to monitor them and even alert on them as they occur. 
Um, if you haven't worked with CloudWatch before, I'll walk you through it and kind of show you how, you know, what it looks like as it relates to DocumentDB. But metrics are just data about the performance of your system. And by default, most AWS services have, uh, have metrics for the resources, uh, EC2 instances, EBS volumes. And for DocumentDB, the main uh, default metrics are things like uh, CRUD operations, how many inserts and deletes, um, throughput data, such as my read IOPS and write IOPS. And, and Karthik alluded to this, we have system information like our index buffer cache hit ratio and, and things like for watching cursors and connections. Um, we talk a lot about these default metrics in our developer guide, specifically around best practices for monitoring and then again, like Karthik said, alerting on these threshold values. You know, he said that he likes to watch when his uh, when his cursors hit 80% of max and get an alert on that. So very, very important. And we're also using those metrics to help uh, cost optimize our systems. You know, really making sure that we've right sized our instances within our cluster. Um, but today we're going to focus on the audit logs and a custom metric that we can create for some of these login events. Um, one thing I'll note is DocumentDB does not charge for enabling audit logs, but there is standard pricing for using CloudWatch logs. So definitely check out the CloudWatch pricing page, get more information on that. Now, I mentioned enabling auditing, and that's because by default, auditing is not enabled on DocumentDB. This is actually a two-step process that you have to go in to enable it. So the first thing I'll do is uh, share my screen here and I'll walk you through the console of what that looks like, where these options are, where these buttons are that you actually actually have to click in order to enable that. So Chad, if you can share my screen. Awesome, thank you so much. So here I'm, and I'm within my uh, AWS console, I'm looking at my document DB clusters. And here on the left side, and let me see if I can increase that size a little bit make that a little bit easier for everybody to see. Enhance, enhance. So there's two things I have to specify whenever I create a document DB cluster. I have to, so I have to uh, give it a subnet group and a parameter group. The subnet group here is basically, where am I living? What, what, what subnets and what VPC is my document DB cluster living in? Parameter groups is a second thing. And the parameter groups kind of like uh, RDS, you have certain parameters that you can set. Um, there are default parameter groups by the engine. So there's a default parameter group for 3.6 and 4.0. And if I go into my default parameter group for 4.0, I see an option here at the top for audit logs. And by default, it's disabled, like I mentioned before. Um, if I try to change this, if I try to edit the default, I'm going to say change that from disabled to en enabled, not going to work. You can't modify a default parameter group. So if I want to enable audit logs, I'm actually have to create a new one. So I'm going to go back to my list of parameter groups, and you can see that I've created this custom 4.0 parameter group, and within it, my audit logs are enabled. So that's step one of that two-step process. Once my parameter group that my document DB cluster belongs to has that parameter enabled, I can go into my cluster. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go into this first cluster. I'm gonna click on the cluster name. I have my tabs here for instances, connectivity and configuration. If I click on configuration, I scroll down. I can see, oh, well, look at this one. This one has a cluster parameter group, the default. But remember, I can't enable logging on that, but I can enable logs on the cluster itself. Well, that's not gonna work because one's disabled, one's enabled. Both have to be enabled. So let me go back to my cluster list. And for those astute uh, watchers who were with us last week, you'll recognize this cluster, the sweep the leg cluster. I'm gonna go to my configuration again, scroll down. Cluster and deserves here, no mercy. It deserves no mercy. Uh, we're using our custom 4.0 with our audit logs enabled. So now it's enabled in both places. Awesome. Now we're going to get CloudWatch logs. Once I do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to a tab that has my CloudWatch console. And then on the left side, I have this group called logs and then log groups. So I'm going to click on my log groups. And you can see that I have a log group that's called AWS DocDB sweep the leg slash audit. And what that's what's happening is all my audit logs are going to that log group. All right, awesome. So how do I filter on this? How do I how do I set up alerts in uh, on failed login events? So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to show you how we would set that up using AWS Cloud Shell. 
Um, last week, I introduced uh, our Cloud9 IDE environment. And this week, I want to show you our Cloud Shell environment to do this. So this is just a browser-based shell that makes it easy to interact with your AWS resources. It's going to come pre-authenticated with the credentials that you're using for console. And it has tools pre-installed, such as AWS CLI, which is what we're going to use today. Um, behind the scenes, it's just like Cloud9. It's just an Amazon uh, Linux 2 environment, but you don't have to patch it or update it at all, and it's free. You, there's no cost for using Cloud Shell. Uh, you are going to pay for the resources you spin up. So, for example, I'm going to spin up some uh, some resources uh, for CloudWatch. I'll pay for those, but I'm not actually paying for Cloud Shell. You get a gig of data with it of persistent storage. So if you wanted to save scripts or files or configuration settings, you could store that in your home directory, and those are going to persist between sessions. Um, we'll, we'll put a link out there to the FAQs page for it, but definitely check this out. This is a really, really cool feature. Um, and what I'm going to do to launch it is here at the top of my console page, I have this icon right next to my alarm and service search bar. And if I click that, and that's going to open up a brand new tab for me. And here's my browser-based terminal. There I am. Um, I can do all uh, you know Linux commands I'm used to, my ls commands, you know, see what's running. All right. So what I'm going to do is within my document DB console, let me go back to it here. Now I'm going to go back to my cluster list, and I have this no mercy uh, cluster, and I want to I've already set it up so that, let me go back to my CloudWatch log here. I've already set it up so that I'm getting uh, logs for it and I wanna enable monitoring and I wanna enable alerting on that. All right, so the first thing I have to do is I have to create a metric filter. So if I come in here, I look at the metric filter, I have nothing in there currently. And if I go back to my log stream, and I go to Sorry, my actual just a time log warning. Just a time warning, we got about three minutes left. Awesome. We'll we'll wrap it up. So this is what it looks like. Uh, this is what the logging looks like in those uh, in that uh, log stream for that new cluster. And what I want to do is I want to filter for whenever I have a message that says authentication failure. So let me go over to my Notepad here, and I've I've pre-made this. I'm just going to copy this out. But this is all an AWS CLI command that I'm going to go into Cloud Shell and run. Cool thing about this is once I paste it in, we have this thing that's called safe paste. So if I you know, did a typo or I forgot one of my backslashes, I could monitor that, paste it in there. I'm going to paste that in here. And this is just saying, put a filter on there, look at that uh, audit log, and try to find any parameter message that says authentication failure. OK, I'm going to do that. I'm gonna go back to my CloudWatch log. I'm gonna go back to my log group. And now if I go to metric filter, you can see, there we go. So now I'm watching for those authentication failures. All right, the next step, let me get some emails when that happens. So let me copy this CLI command. I'm gonna go back to my Cloud Shell. I'm gonna paste that command again with that safe paste. Um, I'm going to say, okay, watch that login uh, failure count. Oh, that's the wrong one. I don't know why that didn't work. We'll clear that out. Ah, I didn't copy everything. There we go. Let me clear this, paste that in there. And this is saying, watch that failure. And if I have more than five failures, uh, over the period of 300 seconds or five minutes, then send a message to this SNS topic I have set up. And this SNS topic is just pointing to my email address. I'm going to hit enter. I'm going to go back to my CloudWatch logs. And on the left side, I'm going to click my alarms. And boom, there we go. There's our alarm for that. And so what I'll do is I'll go back to my document DB console. I'll click into my new cluster. I'm going to click on the connectivity and security and get the connection. I'm gonna copy that connection. And basically, I'm just gonna go back into my same uh, Cloud9 environment we used last week and uh, paste that in there and just send it some bad passwords. Do that over and over and over again. So clearly here, I've I've breached it. I've, I've done more than five failed logins. What's gonna happen is this, this alert will update that it's in alarm as soon as those get parsed out, as soon as those log actions get put into that log uh, group for that audit log. And then, and I already heard the email, 
I'll receive an email similar to this. And this is saying, hey, you have an alarm. You have failed logins on this instance. You probably want to go check that out. So, But again, I just wanted to use this as a demonstration on how to set up those audit log alarms. I did it for failed logins. You can do it for anything. You know, you can do it for a default metrics. You can do it for... Uh, you know, dropping a collection, dropping a database, whatever fits your need. And then again, um, the ability to do all this through Cloud Shell. One thing I'll, I'll add is you actually can install a Mongo Shell to Cloud Shell, but right now Cloud Shell cannot connect to private VPCs. But that's coming. So eventually you'll be able to connect to your document DB cluster from Cloud Shell. Uh, all right, Chad, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, thanks, Cody. That's super important. And it's really important to be uh, setting alerts for things that you're monitoring, whether it's these types of security alarms or, uh, you know, anything else, really, if you're monitoring it, you're probably one gonna uh, gonna want to alert on it as well. Uh, so you get notified if something goes out of whack. And uh, Cody, if you want to paste any links in uh, around uh, your GitHub uh, repo that has the sample code, that'd be super helpful. Um, all right, so let's wrap it up. There's another show starting in about a minute. Uh, I'm Chad Tendall, your host, uh, along with my co-host Karthik, and I, we want to thank Cody for joining us today and demoing all this great stuff. We do have another show coming up. Uh, you know, we do this once a month. The next episode, uh, sorry, let me share my screen so you see it. Next episode is going to be April 15th, uh, same bat time, same bat channel, 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern here at twitch.tv slash AWS. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today, and I hope you have a nice week. Thank you. Enjoy.